So um, I don't have a martini tonight, by the way. You know what I do have instead? Tell me. Oh, no. Are you having a colonoscopy? I'm getting the camera put up the butt. Yeah, yeah, I know that stuff. Take light. That's... Uh, that. This is just... You know, and the instructions on it explicitly state that you should drink rapidly. Yes. And the know. reason why is if you don't drink it rapidly, you will throw it back up. Because it's got that weird metallic taste. Uh, it even advises you to put it in the fridge because yes. it'll help it taste less bad. In there done that understand uh, and you're supposed to drink it all within an hour two hours uh every 15 minutes i'm supposed to chug 250 milliliters well that's not so bad i my instructions were one hour get it down as quickly as you possibly can so you're drinking this right now uh, not at the moment because i'm a little worried about losing are you lunch gonna, that i don't actually have are, are you going to be able to make it through the podcast or are you gonna have to run out I ran out before the big show got started. Peg like catches up to you. It's a oh. you sometimes. I don't know if I, <laughs> I trust it. If I disappear in the middle of the recording session, I'll, you'll I'll, know exactly why. We've all reached that age where it, it comes time to put the camera up there, and it's a, it's a good thing to do. You don't have to do it. Uh, at your age, you're going to only have to do it once. Uh, well, uh, tomorrow, I guess, right? It's tomorrow afternoon, yeah. Yes, and that'll be it for 10 years. Uh, I hope so. No, well, providing you're spick and span down there. <laughs> I think that's part of what the peg light's supposed to do is to make you spick and span down there. This is You laugh at me. This is why I go to my detox center in, in, in Thailand. Yeah, yeah, that's what you say you go to the detox center in Thailand for. I think you're going to a detox center in Thailand for something else. No. Well, How about we change the topic? Amy, are you with us? I don't know what I just walked into. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Michael's getting a colonoscopy tomorrow. Right, I was going to say, did I just walk into colonoscopy talk? <laughs> We're not renaming the podcast if that's uh, a consolation. Listen, I, having had done it, uh, I think, three years ago, you're getting put out, right? You know what? Here's the thing. Um, and not, not, to, not to belabor an unnecessary point with, with Amy and everyone else present. I really wanted to be awake for the camera up the butt. No, 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 no. You do not. Now, I understand I don't, but the geek boy in me, Mr. Science, really wants to know. Ask them to make a recording. Wouldn't it be like the ultimate selfie? Bur <laughs> yeah, burn that to DVD, transfer it to Instagram, and uh, post it for the whole world to see. Shall we start the show? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. From the headquarters of Geeks and Beats magazine, now with 1.2 billion subscribers on iTunes and GeoCities, this is the world's most popular podcast with Alan Cross and Michael Hainsworth, featuring musical guest Sting. 57 years ago this week, saw the first woman in space, and she wasn't American. Neither is Amy Title. She's from the vintage space. She'll join us to look back at Valentina Tereshkova's contribution. Plus, why Michael is dead wrong now about Steve Carell's Space Force. He's no Michael Scott. And now, Alan Cross and Michael Hainsworth. At geeksandbeats.com, our ace reporter, Amber Healy, put together this fascinating piece on the first woman in space 1963 june 16th we generally focus on what the americans have accomplished and then when a canadian gets in there we wave the flag as well the u.s put a man on the moon first but it was the russians who sent a woman to space first and as amber writes from the early days of the space race research supported the idea of women serving as astronauts as cosmonauts um generally they're smaller i, I suppose it's a lot like jockeys with racing you want them to be lighter because every extra pound costs in fuel am i right Right, and the old Vauxhall and Vostok spacecrafts that the Soviets used to launch up there, they were tiny. They were really, really small. When they went from a two-man crew to a three-man crew, they didn't make the spacecraft any bigger. So they said, well, we're going to have to create some room somehow. So uh, uh, none of you guys will be wearing spacesuits. And that's how they got three people in. 
I want to get more information about this. I really want to get a, a better understanding about this because you know, we also have the SpaceX uh, news over the course of the last week or so. And then the Russians sort of threw some shade at Elon Musk o- over that, uh, all of that and more. So uh, joining us from the Vintage Space Channel on YouTube is Amy Title. Amy, thank you so, so much for joining us again. Yeah, thank you so much for having me back. Did I get it right about the spacesuits and the three guys? Yeah, well, it was actually when they went from one to three, um, they didn't change. So the Vostok spacecraft is the first. Voskhod came second. They just like emptied out some of the stuff and took away the spacesuits, and then you can get three men in the one-man crew. So when they had two men up, they had one of them in a pressure suit to be able to walk outside. So you're basically like... Yeah, it was sketchy. <laughs> in a word, sketchy. <laughs> well, remember when Yuri Gagarin went up, he was the first man in space. He, um, I don't, he did not land with the spacecraft. He ejected, didn't he? Yeah, he did. They didn't have a man-rated uh, landing system for the Vostok. So what they had to do was eject at 10,000 feet and land by personal parachute. And I've actually seen in, there's a, a museum in Kansas, the Kansas Cosmosphere in Hutchinson, that has a Vostok with the ejection seat, like, popping out of it as if it's, like, mid, mid-ejection mid for landing. And you just look at it and you're like, what? How did anyone look at this and say, yeah, that's all right? <laughs> Wait a minute. When, when, when they went from one to three... And one guy had to wear a spacesuit. What did the other guys do when the door opened? They had an airlock. So I'm, I'm remembering a lot. Of, I'd have to go over and like double check everything. But the, it was Vostok, Voskhod 2 that had the first EVA. And it was Alexei Leonov and I think it was Pavel Belyayev was the, other, was the other cosmonaut. And they were each in a suit, but only Leonov had the one that could actually support him outside in the vacuum of space. So they had an airlock. So Belyayev was somewhat protected, but not nearly as well as Leonov was. And uh, it's because Leonov's suit was a lot bulkier. They couldn't actually get two of them in. All right, let's come back to the introduction to this conversation. <laughs> We've got a little derailed. Yeah, we got a little technology. derailed off the top. <laughs> Valentina Tereshkova, 26 years old, strapped into a rocket ship. And this isn't the first time she's found herself under a high pressure situation. It's really interesting when we kind of look at the, the first woman in space being a cosmonaut because she came directly out of this apparent push in the United States to launch a female astronaut, which was actually not something NASA was planning to do and was in fact uh, crusaded as like a, a private want by Jerry Cobb. Um, but the Soviets decided, okay, let's just launch a woman. Let's score a psychological first. Let's get a propaganda victory and started looking at what do we need? And again, like you mentioned, they didn't land with the crash. So what they needed was someone who could sit still, do as they were told, because the spacecraft was completely automated. They didn't even have a way. I think they could maneuver a little bit with RCS thrusters, but like they couldn't take control of the craft. It was entirely automated. The one thing that the pilot really had to do was eject and land by parachute. So when they started looking for women that could fill this role of first cosmonaut, they started looking at women who had a parachute background and who fit the mold of what you want the first woman in space to be. And that is a devout communist who rose up through the system to show that you could be great if you played into the communist way of life because communism is better than democracy because in Soviet Union women go into space and in America they don't that was really like why she was chosen but wasn't the idea of putting a Russian cosmonaut a female Russian cosmonaut into space in the first place because they had gotten wind that the Americans were in fact considering the same thing as you say Yes. I mean, they they got wind of it because it was playing out in the media a lot. And uh, they weren't, NASA was never considering a female astronaut program in the early 60s. Um, But but there was was this one woman, Jerry Cobb, who was really trying to push this idea. She she was the one who did the, the astronaut medical tests. And when the media picked up the story, said, oh, look, there's a woman astronaut. And she's like, yes, I am the woman astronaut. And like basically tried to leverage the media into doing what she wanted to see done. So there, she was kind of the quote unquote leader of a group of a dozen women who'd all done a bunch of medical tests. And they got enough play in the media that the Soviet Union started actually picking up on the story. And the Soviet space program, the, the people who were leading the Soviet space program d- couldn't discern whether or not NASA was actually doing something or whether this was coming, um, you know, just as media reporting. So to be safe, decided, okay, let's consider launching a woman to be the first. Now, I do have a question about um, something um, awkward. 
I have been told or have read that one of the issues about putting a woman in space was uh, having to deal with uh, bodily waste. Is that true? There was the issue that uh, I love. I love do, doing this and trying to put it uh, politely. Uh, plumbing is different between men and women. Yes, it's a little bit easier for a man because a man can put himself into a tube, and the relief tube is a very simple system. Uh, a woman does not have that. There needs to be something to create a sort of seal between the relief system and the body. So it's a little bit more difficult for women, and that was, you know one of the arguments that some people made early on in the 60s, I think as a way of kind of masking the uh, systemic sexism that was keeping women out. And there were, you know, there was deep, deep issues in terms of women not having the quote unquote right stuff because they couldn't be military pilots. Well, didn't um, Sally Ride get asked by NASA if a hundred tampons right, yeah. would be enough for her to her flight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, because you, you went to the issue of, of using the washroom and how that's different for women. Um, the other issue is there was this whole question of menstruation and going back to the second world war, I mean, people in charge of the army air force at the time, um, used the argument that women became unstable during menstruation, that they couldn't be trusted to fly a plane. And there were reports written after the war, after the uh, Women's Air Force Service Pilots um, program that was run by Jackie Cocker. And she wrote a report for Hap Arnold right after the Air Force became a standalone uh, standalone service, sort of saying, you know, women performed admirably. Here's all the data. And also, there was absolutely no effect of menstruation. Plus, um, in space, no bears. <laughs> in space, no bears. Um, but the issue of menstruation is actually really, really bizarre and really interesting because I, I just love this idea. Okay, yes, Sally Ride was asked if for a weak mission, 100 tampons was enough, which is laughable to any woman and any man who talks to women about these things. Um, but the other thing they weren't sure of was whether uh, blood would actually drain from the body without gravity, which is, you know, it's the, they thought that blood might actually pool up in the abdominal cavity. And I just love the idea that a bunch of male doctors with wives didn't know that the uterus is not actually the same as the stomach. So like, how is this blood migrating through organs? It became like reading the early reports on it. It's just like, I don't understand how you can know everything about the human body and just like skip this lesson in class. <laughs> We've evolved a little bit. Since <laughs> yeah. Having said that, though, were there specific things that they had to take into consideration for her that they would not have had to take into consideration for a man other than biology? I think it was for, for Tereshkova, and I'd have to look up super quick how long her flight was. I think it was it was less than a day. Um, so you know, there's not much that you have to do for a day. Hold it. Um, uh, 48 hours. Uh, is it 48 hours? No, 48 orbits in 71 hours. Oh, it was that. Oh, it was it was a longer one? Okay, because I think because she was she was Vostok six and Vostok five and six were one of the ones that were quote unquote dual missions. So they they crossed paths in orbit, even though they could not see or interact with each other at all. Um, and it was just by virtue of the orbits lining up that way, they couldn't actually control to get into those orbits. So three days, but three days is not you know if you're um, they didn't have a lot of room. I. I don't know who the first woman to menstruate in space was, but I'm reasonably sure it was not Tereshkova. I've actually asked some astronauts this, and they know, but they won't share the knowledge. But I'm pretty sure it wasn't her, because um, in the Vostok, I don't think you had room to do things like take off your suit to pee, let alone, you know, deal with hygiene products. So, you know, you would have just launched not during her cycle, and... Uh, and then I think it's just a matter of, I don't know exactly what the urine collection system was, but it would be probably something as simplistic as like a little, a little tube connected to a pouch or something. And, you know, otherwise it's just, you just sit there and you kind of do your job. You just listen to the, listen to the recordings from earth and eat when you're scheduled to and gather some data and then become celebrated as the, uh, an icon for the Soviet union. She, she basically had to sit there for about 71 hours. Yeah. Which sounds a lot worse than than the day that, it, for some reason, was in my head. <laughs> a Vostok Five um, was the mission that launched what on June fourteenth. She was um, pi the pilot of Vostok Six, and they they passed each other. And, and according to uh, Amber's research on Geeks and Beats, um, of those seventy hours they spent in space, they exchanged messages, and that was part of that mission to try to figure out if it was possible right. to do that sort of thing. But then she also had her own mission parameters of which the government accused her of failing and she accused the craft of failing. 
I think your detailed research, see, I've done, <laughs> this is where I have to just admit, I've done more work on how she got into space than what she did in space. Well, tell um, me about how she got into space. So, then. so the how, the how she got into space is really just this, this interesting story of, you know, you, you want, her, I, I feel really bad every time I get a, an email from a grade school kid doing a project on, you know, the history of women's rights and stuff. And they want to write about Tereshkova as kind of that first trailblazer trailblazer for women and really you know she was selected because of her pedigree and kind of her backstory that her father had died in fighting uh for the soviet army and i forget which war but a, a local a civil war um and she'd worked as a worked in a textile factory since she was 14 to help support the family because i think she was the eldest daughter so she became this this woman who you know had been working in the system to to help her family to kind of do everything that she had to do to kind of make sure her family could survive. And apparently at, in the, at the time, uh, Soviet children or, or school kids rather could have one leisure activity. Like you had the chance to pursue one hobby and she somehow got interested in parachuting early on and she trained as a parachute jumper, which is no, I mean, that's nothing to sneeze at. That is scary and, and intense work. Um, but she was that she just happened to kind of have this interest, but it was sort of this thing she did on the side um, while she was working and supporting her family. And it really became this, well, she's got the right pedigree and she's also like quite good looking. Like you could put her face on a stamp. Um, Gagarin was selected for a lot of the same reasons. He kind of rose up through the uh, through the, the communist system the same way. He was a very handsome man. He was five foot two. I mean, you were speaking earlier about how women are smaller and lighter, and a five foot two man is smaller and lighter than the average like five foot eleven American astronauts. But the uh, I've never been to Russia, but the the statues of Gagarin that were erected not long after his flight are like, you know, make him look seven feet tall. I have been to Russia. But Pike, you have, you have. Have you seen these statues where he's like this gargantuan figure and like he's he's my size? Yes, he's tiny. <laughs> little tiny guy. Yes, I've been to the Cosmonaut Museum. So yes, right. And there and there's these these statues are everywhere. They're like outside in front of big buildings. There's just you know him on a sixty foot like rising out of a star shape into this like pose. You know, it's there's there's a lot more. I think. I think a lot of those early flights are as much about um, harnessing Soviet technology and kind of the fact that the Soviet space program was built out of its missile program. So it wasn't about separating the two for the sake of exploration. It was about changing one missile such that you could put a manned spacecraft on it instead of a warhead. And then how you can manipulate all of this to create the illusion of more technological progress in the United States. And, you know, it becomes an, an interesting thing of what they said versus what they had. Yeah, these things were essentially flying washing machines. Yeah, no, they they're, a lot of them are really scary. <laughs> Well, you had mentioned the last time you were on the program that unlike uh, NASA and the American space program, that there was a lot of uh, MacGyvering of the Russian space program, a lot of uh, bundling twine and, and popsicle sticks type uh, of thing. But you did say um, that she was chosen in part because of her looks. And in the Steve Carell parody Space Force. Such a good show, by the way. <laughs> there, well, we should get into that, too. But there, there's, a, there's the character. He's the social media guy who insists Noah goes. And we laugh because we think some shallow-minded jackass is insisting that these astronauts be pretty. Yet, in reality, we know that some of these decisions were made that way in the first place. I don't remember what his character's name is in the show because I've watched Parks and Rec so much, so I just think of him as John Ralphio. But, exactly. Um, yeah, when John Ralphio says that, I, I did, I, same, I laughed because it was funny and it was just so like, of course the social media manager says that, but it's like, no, this was a serious consideration when you're, when you're dealing with something that's super automated and you're not really giving them too much control the optics of what you're doing you can control that so that's kind of where you 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 are able to kind of manipulate everything you need i mean it's definitely the american astronauts went through they all went through very rigorous training but uh, you know you could not say that al shepherd was as handsome as gagarin i don't think um mm -hmm. some of them were not he was a bit rugged looking. Yeah, very uh, rugged looking. <laughs> but yeah. for, for the most part, the, the Mercury 7 were all pretty, 
you know, clean cuts, all American They're, boys. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, down to, I think they each had two kids or three kids. They each had a beautiful wife. They were all, I think almost, they were all religious. I think mostly Presbyterian. I looked this up once. I can't remember, but they, they like the same way that Gagarin fit the mold of what they wanted the icon of the Soviet Union to be. The Mercury astronauts fit that as well. You know, they were perfect. The, the clean family men, military service, decorated pilots, accomplished and technically incredibly proficient. I mean, it, they, they were the model of what America kind of needed, I think, in some ways in 1959. So it's, it's two sides of the same coin in a lot of ways. They're just, they need different things. Because um, the Mercury, I mean, the early Mercury missions were just as automated. They didn't have a lot of control. It, was, it wasn't really until the Gemini flights that they got to actually fly in space and before that it was like let's let's make sure your eyeballs don't distort Werner von braun famously said to those guys just sit there <laughs> got it all automated and then they got the pushback saying no we're pilots yeah and that's i guess when they started looking at gemini and figured, yeah or sorry gemini i got gemini. <laughs> <laughs> when they started getting uh you know when when you know, neil armstrong for example went up with with yeah. uh, gemini he had to be a super, super pilot for that one mission yeah. where the capsule spun out of control after a failed docking with the Aegean spacecraft. See, I'm a nerd yeah. because I love all this stuff. Well, of course. We know, we know you're a nerd. No, but that's absolutely right. You know, the early, the early flights when there were issues, they could do mild stuff to override, but a lot of it was the grounds getting the telemetry. You know, with John Glenn, just for argument's sake, John Glenn's uh, the, the indication that his landing bag had deployed, which would mean that his heat shield was separated from the spacecraft, and that could be a non-survivable re-entry. You know, he got the data. It was mirrored in mission control, so they knew it was going on. But it's not like he had the, the ability to do much. It was sort of like, well, you're going to keep the retro pack on, and that's coming up from the ground, and you just don't fire it, and we won't fire it, and you just do it. Whereas on Gemini 8, it was, okay, well, no one really knows what's happening because this telemetry doesn't make any sense, so we're going to have an ace pilot figure out how to get us out of this role and figure out what happens next. And that, I mean, that was, oh, that was a life-threatening mission, that one. Yeah, because uh, yeah. they were in danger of blacking out because of the yeah. forces yeah. caused by the centrifugal spin. Not only that, but they used the uh, some of the reentry fuel to uh, correct the roll and kind of stabilize the spacecraft, which means that you have to reenter right away. And the computer on that spacecraft was sophisticated, but couldn't hold a lot of data. So the ground is actually reading up one line of code, and they're 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 deleting one line and entering another line as they go to make sure they get the entire new program because it was suddenly an emergency reentry program. I don't even know like how that computer works because I'm unfortunately not a computer person enough, but it's, it's such an interesting thing. It's like, you survived that. Now let's figure out how to get you home. <laughs> okay, now let's figure out the next thing. How is it that you actually are enjoying Space Force with Steve Carell? I love it. I don't know. I, I'm surprised that it's gotten bad early reviews. I, I like it. I watched <laughs> it all the way through. Like, I do too. Is, is uh, hot and cold. My friend Phil, who watches these things all the time, says he'll watch anything with space in the title, but he felt it was uneven. I, I'm sorry, I enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to season two. I hope there is a season two. Last I saw, they are planning, it was intended to be multiple seasons, so I'm really, really hoping that... Um, that it does go and that it starts getting picked up soon. But I, I thought, I mean, there's, there's, you know, it's not, it had its moments that were like, eh, this didn't land as much as I would like it to. But overall, I thought the whole, just voted in a poll. I thought the whole thing was just like such a funny you, take on the entire- vote in our poll? Yes. Alan, <laughs> was that on my poll? screen. <laughs> It, it, it popped up on my screen. Of course I'm going to vote. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, so, see, I can't vote because I'm the one who created the poll. So this is completely skewed. We're going to need the interns <laughs> who are watching this live stream recording of the world's most popular podcast to vote as well. Oh, my God. It's unanimous. See? Look at this. You guys are creaming me. It's slow. It's I think it's slow, but I like, I like that slow burn. And it might be I... Um, I don't know. I, I, my, I was raised on Monty Python, so I was raised on the kind of slower, funny stuff that's like, it doesn't deliver right away so much as you're watching this and you're like, oh, this is a thing that's, uh, it, it felt almost that like old school British pacing to me in some things. And, and then just like the absurdity of it. <laughs> I, I like the characters. The sets are terrific. Yeah. My sure. favorite thing, I really, really want the moon camo suits. I know. I know. <laughs> never see the best so thing. Cool. The best thing about this is that Netflix and that show 
has the trademark for the term space force. I know. I know. For the government. That was so funny. I saw that article. I'm like, I never really, I never thought about it. I don't know where Space Force, the real Space Force, I'm using air quotes, is in terms of it's becoming a real thing. But like, yeah, I never thought about the fact that they don't necessarily own the name now. Is there a flag and a logo? And the logo looks exactly like the oh, Federation logo. It's so funny. There's so many, like, it's one of those shows that I, I, I watched it, I think, last weekend. Um, but in a couple of weeks, I want to throw it on again and just, like, see all the background jokes that I didn't get the first time. Because I feel like this is a show that's going to layer that stuff in. And it's uh, just going to get better as you rewatch it. Uh, You're really no. not loving it, no, eh? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I think I think the, the breakout character is the John Malkovich character. I think Absolutely. he's probably the only yeah. one that's saving it. But my favorite thing, if I had to pick one thing, and it's probably only one thing that I like about Space Force, is the Lisa Kudrow character has been imprisoned for 40 years. Like that. We, we just find out that out of nowhere, his wife has yeah. been in prison for four and not once do they ever explain why. Yeah. yeah. I read an article about that because I was very curious if like I missed something or if that's part of like what one of the cliffhangers they left to deliberately to force a second season and they said, we know why. We just thought it would be really funny if we just never actually referenced why until like the end of the series and you're like, oh. And the whole thing, just speaking of Steve Carell, just made, makes me think of uh, the line in Anchorman of Brick killed the guy. Like, are we just going to, is it just going to be that, like, she just killed someone with a trident and we find that out at the end? Like, <laughs> but that's the problem with, with the, the Steve Carell character is that you're expecting either a Brick Tamlin from Anchorman, Legend of Ron Burgundy, or you're expecting more of an office kind of Michael Scott character. And we're not getting either of those. And I, I don't really feel that there's anything with the character that I'm, I'm hooked to. Like, I, I don't feel a connection to him. I don't feel a connection to any of them. See, I think you're, you're completely wrong. I mean, Steve Carell is more than those two characters. I mean, have you ever seen Foxcatcher? No. Oh, well, there you go. He is, he's a really good actor with a, a quite a range. And I kind of like seeing him as a guy in charge who is oddly competent, but has everything falling apart around him. I have to say, better than Avenue 5, though. Yes, Avenue 5, a huge disappointment. Sorry. It's Avenue 5. Ah, uh, see, Amy doesn't even know about Avenue 5. This is uh, the, uh, what, what's his name? He played, played Dr. House. Hugh Laurie. Hugh Laurie. It's the new Hugh Laurie in space. The, uh, oh, the, the cruise oh, ship is oh, drifting. I heard, I heard that it was almost unwatchable. It is completely unwatchable, which is I why I watched three episodes. Things. Which <laughs> is really, really sad, considering that it was created by the same guy who created Veep. Oh, right. That was because Veep is so I mean, good. Yeah. And yeah. Veep is just like one of the greatest TV shows of the last 20 years. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, just, I can watch it again and again and again and hear things that I never heard the first time. Yeah. Through. And I was hoping for something similar with that. Right. And it never happened. Now, right. since we're there, Picard. Have you watched that? No, I haven't. Yeah. I, I, I got it. I'm not a Star Trek fan. She, 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 oh, I, oh, I don't oh, think she's a real geek, dude. <laughs> <laughs> my, my geekdom extends uh, not very far into the science fiction. Let's come back then to reality <laughs> and uh, present day. First of all, um, SpaceX had uh, some interesting news, maybe, do you think? Maybe, perhaps? What, so again, here's the thing. I am dealing in history all the time. What was the latest news? Because you guys were talking about it when I came in, so I feel like you should enlighten me, and then I'll give you a, a flash response. Um, yeah, give us a hot take. Uh, no, it's just the idea that, that finally Elon Musk managed to get um, actual astronauts in a oh, capsule just, up just into the space launch. to the okay. ISS. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that this is a, basically, I was, I was going to say it's America's return to space as, but it's more um, an American corporation's return. To yeah, space. yeah. So to be clear, I did watch the launch. Let's say I'm not like not following. I just didn't know if there was if something else had happened or if he'd said something because I know they're always doing stuff that I hear about from my SpaceX fanboy friends like three days after the fact. Um, yeah, no, I it is it is interesting and it's I thought I found the whole the whole thing is a very interesting thing just because you're right it, it it's it's being touted as America's response. And, you know, the, the president is trying to t you know, say, we did this and it has nothing to do with him and almost nothing to do with NASA. I mean, NASA, I, I looked a little bit back at the funding because I've been writing about this since, I don't know, 2000, 
11 or so. And, it, you know, it, NASA did some of the original funding to help SpaceX get off the ground and stuff. But it is really interesting that we're in a completely new era of sp human spaceflight now, I think. And I don't really know what that's going to look like because it's, it's, not, it's not clear to me whether it's going to be a division of labor where like SpaceX takes over the uh, orbital stuff so that NASA can focus on the deep space missions, on the lunar, on the Martian missions, um, or if it's just going to be like, well, we both need these capabilities and SpaceX is going to sort of shift into the commercial element or, you know, it's, it's really, it's been a different thing, a very interesting thing. And I'm not really sure what, how it's going to work. And part of it is because SpaceX doesn't necessarily, you know, publicize all that stuff because it's a private company. They don't have to, whereas NASA has to, tell me what's going on because because it's you know, taxpayer money because it's taxpayer money and well, i am a taxpayer no, wait a second, wait a second. <laughs> what, what's what about that uh, that mini shuttle that the air force keeps setting up for 800 days and there's that what is that the x-37b yes mm -hmm. no yep. one knows i mean that's no. taxpayer but that's military right. so i we forget could tell what... you but we'd have to kill you <laughs> exactly everyone will speculate and no one will know the Russians were pretty amused by SpaceX, and uh, back when they had that big bun fight in 2014, um, and the Russians were like, well, you know, if you guys want to get back up to the ISS, I guess you could use a, a trampoline, since they pulled the plug on the, the space shuttle. Um, so Elon Musk tweeted, the trampoline is working. And the Russians responded back with, well, good luck with that, and pointed out that... <laughs> oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pointed out that the Soyuz yes. is the world's most reliable spacecraft yeah. with 173 yeah. successful flights and only three aborts over the course of, what, since the 1970s or so. Yeah, that's what's really interesting. I mean, the Soyuz, to be fair has gone through different revisions and it's not exactly the exact same one that started flying in 1967 that one of course uh, famously killed its pilot it was not ready to fly and it was fast track to try to keep pace with apollo but um yeah the, the soyuz is like the workhorse of the space age for soviet union slash russia i mean it's been flying largely without incident um granted its incidents have been significant but Still, it has a better track record, a better safety and performance record than anything, um, anything else that's flown. So it's really interesting that people are sort of, you know, hating on it and super down on it when not only is it a reliable way to go, albeit the inside looks really cramped and I've sat in a model of it and it is very small and kind of scary, um, but it's, you know, that, that NASA was launching astronauts up with the Soyuz is, you know, it finally space became truly, you know, a collaborative effort. We've got between that and the ISS, like it's been this really nice thing of like, we're doing this for humanity now and we can stop duplicating technology and actually maybe work together. So like, you know, you do orbit, we'll do this and we'll all do it for, he and it's never going to be like that. Cause it's always going to be politicized and I live in a dream world in that sense. But yeah, no, this, the Soyuz is really like the workhorse that's, that's, has a great record and it's weird there's that people a, hate on it and we'll a, see if spacex can keep pace with it really there's another reason why the soviets are going to be thrown shade and that's because they were making a lot of money from the that americans too. uh as as their their uber up to the space station yeah well, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen now. Um, I know, you know, the SpaceX demonstrating that it can launch humans to the ISS without incident is great, but if something happens on a future launch, I mean, that could delay it, that could push it back, that could say, well, we did this once, we had a, an issue, now we have to go back to the drawing board for a couple of years, we're still going to rely on Soyuz. I don't know that it's going to be like, we launched this once, we are never going back to Russia, so much as we're, we're working on the future together. So I, I don't know, I don't really know where the negotiations are in terms of who NASA is going to use as a launch provider, because really buying a ticket from SpaceX is the same as buying a ticket from Russia. It's NASA's still just the, uh, the consumer at that point, just buying a, a seat. But hopefully if it's going to be the SpaceX Uber versus the Soyuz Uber, at least they'll put some bottled water in the backseat. <laughs> they would, it would be, it wouldn't even just be bottled water. It'd be, you know, Voss or one, whatever the one is with a fancy lid, it would be the fancy bottled water. <laughs> Now, on the other hand, uh, they launch out of Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan has my favorite vodka, which is called Snow Queen. Ooh. I wouldn't be surprised if the, uh, the Soyuz actually snuck a couple bottles of vodka oh, in the back, so disguised as bottled water. <laughs> Amy, thank you so much for joining us again. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's been fun. Amy Title of The Vintage Space. 
London, Bangkok, New York, Cincinnati. From the worldwide headquarters of Geeks and Beats magazine, this is a GNB News Update. We want to say thank you to Sheila McMahon for being a member of the world's worst intern program until now. Oh, did we lose her? Did she drop off? She dropped off, but that's okay. What you do is if you want to support the show, you go to geeksandbeats.com, click the support the show link, and you sign up via Patreon. And what the benefit of Patreon is, of course, is that you can set a lifetime limit. So maybe Sheila just decided, you know what? It's COVID-19. We got to pull back on the purse strings here. Maybe it's time to rein it in. So, Sheila, thank you so much for joining us over the course of your time as a member of the World's Worst uh, Intern Program. And also, Kurt Austin, who was uh, dinged an extra 25 bucks as a co-producer uh, on Patreon, we, we refunded him on that one because okay. he was only there for, for that uh, previous episode where we were talking to Rob Wells about uh, his crowd-sourced music video. Mm-hmm. That was the right thing to do. Good job. Yeah, uh, but we would very much appreciate it if you'd uh, support the show. And if you do, what happens is we will send you a link so that you can join us for the recording session. And at the end of the recording session, we'll give you an opportunity to ask the guest uh, or us uh, any questions, if you've got any questions for us. Uh, so with that in mind, um, we want to say thank you very much to a whole host of Patreons, Patreons, patrons who have made it possible uh, for us to uh, be here today. Uh, Adrian Bashford, Alyssa Sang, Antoinette Vanden Dickenberg, uh, Craig Aitken, uh, Craig Glassford, David S. Don Woodle, Jason Winterbaum, uh, Kevin Ryan, Kyle Philstrom, uh, Mark Wagner, among others. And of course, uh, joining us uh, here uh, at Studio 3B via Zoom, we've got Mike H., Crystal, David S. is here, Adrian, uh, Grant Ridge, and Stephen uh, as well. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. So, uh, do you have any other announcements, or am I going to have to go and grab myself another swig of peg light? I, I think you should go and get that done because you need to maintain a certain input schedule. I know that, but I'm afraid of the output schedule. All right, well, then just wait. We'll finish this. Uh, we'll do it fairly quickly then because okay. Michael has to go to the bathroom, and it's not his fault. He is doing this uh, out of medical necessity. Yeah, I'm going to edit all that out. Oh, great. <laughs> Catch all new episodes of Geeks and Beats Wednesdays on iTunes. And watch for Geeks and Beats magazine on a newsstand near you. To be part of next week's show, call area code 323-319-NERD. Follow the stories on Twitter, Facebook, and get your dose of Geeks and Beats anytime at geeksandbeats.com. The Geeks and Beats podcast would like to thank the National Science Foundation. All right, uh, let's do a little Q&A. Uh, so we get uh, Mike, Adrian, Grant, uh, Crystal, David, and Stephen, among uh, others. If you've got a, uh, uh, something you want to throw out there, why don't you uh, pull a, uh, turn off your microphone and uh, put your uh, hand up to your mic. In the meantime, uh, what's going on in your world, Amy, as far as uh, the vintage space? Um, I'm actually working on changing formats a little bit. So I want to do some like deeper dive think piece type videos instead of the straight presentation of research just because I think it's more fun and I want to dig in and actually kind of do a op- more op-ed style. So I'm actually working right now on a deep dive of um, how every president has leveraged space for whatever his needs were and kind of why we see certain trends the way we do. Um, namely, it's recent Republicans who try to do a Kennedy moment um, and why I think that happens. So I'm kind of been researching uh, presidential space policy um, from Eisenhower to Trump for a while. And I just bought a teleprompter. So now oh, I can actually like, tar- it wasn't the parrot teleprompter. Was no, it? why? Oh, cause that's the, that's the cheapo one I've got. Okay. Yeah. I, I keep hearing people use it. No, I, I just bought a, um, I bought an iPad and a, it's just whatever one, I forget what the brand is, but it doesn't have a camera mount on the back because I just record on my phone. So I can just yeah. like put my phone up. I need to rig the little hood so it stays up over the phone um, and just put this in a different stand and, and just go. But um, this the way I can The secret to reading on a teleprompter, read the line just above the lens of the camera. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> not the one on the camera and not the one yeah. below it. Because if you read the one below it, it looks like you're looking at everybody's chin. If you read the huh. one on it, it looks like you're looking at their nose. Eh, makes sense. Uh, all right. So uh, yeah. Adrian raised his hand. Adrian, hello. 
Hello. So f first, uh, thanks for explaining why Space Forks makes so many uh, tampon references. That's why that was, uh, I cleared <laughs> that up. Um, I, the other comment, uh, uh, it seems like you might have talked about it before, but the, the Gemini versus Gemini. I'm just wondering yeah. if, uh, where that comes from. Yeah, um, I did a video about this once because people kept like harping on me for mispronouncing Gemini. Um, and I looked it up and NASA deliberately pronounces it Gemini, not Gemini, to create a separation from the astrological constellation. Um, and that, I mean, it's as simple as that. And I, when I did that video, I actually found a bunch of archived footage from the Gemini era and I clipped every, you know, it's that, that, that 1960s newsreader voice and the NASA Gemini six astronauts. And I, cl I clipped every time for like, I, I've got a two minute cut of like Gemini, Gemini, Gemini six, Gemini, Gemini. And it's really, it gets, it starts to sound like Gemini cricket, but yeah, that's, that's why NASA did it. And I just did a video to explain it. So people would stop harassing me and it's great. Cause now people are like, you pronounced it wrong, comma expletive. I can just respond with that video link. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that. And, and what's this shirt? It looks vaguely familiar. It's uh, this is a uh, creature from the, from the black lagoon. Okay. It's, thanks. Uh, yeah. It's a, it's a uh, designer, a local to me designer in Burbank that I love. Oh, the old bangs. <laughs> yep. The old bangs. So this is you explaining Gemini or Gemini. Yeah. Speak on. Oh, hey, there, hey, there's your cat. <laughs> So I don't know if you can share the audio with it too, but it's just, yeah, it's that, it's that video. If you, if you search Gemini versus yeah. Gemini on my channel, it pops up. But I'm just there's another, the there's a, another super cut from this past week. It's from Star Trek Next Generation. And it, did you know the one I'm talking about? No. No, oh, because you're not a Star Trek fan. Yeah. Uh, it is, uh, look up Star Trek Next Generation, some kind of. Star Trek Next I, Generation. I feel like I can imagine where this is going. I, one of my favorites, speaking of, uh, there's a great supercut of. That's it. The one at the top. Yep. Do we have to listen to it? No, it's funny. You'll see. I don't even know if you can hear this. No. No, we can't. Yeah, but it's yeah. the some kind of some next kind generation of. supercut. Okay. And it's, it's really funny because you don't realize exactly how much of a writing crutch uh, so the, the, the writers used, uh, you'll see. All right. Uh, so apparently there's a hands up feature that I didn't know existed yeah. that uh, Adrian had used. So uh, if you've got a, a question or a comment you want to throw in about life, the universe and everything. So if you uh, click on the participants, is that how it works? Yeah. Click on participants. And then you'll see on the right hand side, those first thing is uh, raise hand. Um, oh. oh, look at that. We're all, we're all it's the <laughs> learning stuff. That's awesome. Okay. So clearly we've just got a lot of lurkers here. That's fine. <laughs> That's okay. We get in this early after all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you didn't drink that a whole tub. I have to drink. The, I, speaking of tubs, I filled it with water using the tub because it was the most easily accessible tap. Oh, my yes, gosh. I have to drink half of it. In, uh, I, Technically, I'm supposed to drink half of it within the next 16 minutes, and then the remainder oh of it all before the big event. Wow. <laughs> um, I see someone with a hand up in the, in the Simpsons living room. Oh, there's Grant Ridge. Let's unmute Grant. Hi, Grant. Having experienced exactly what you're about to go through, Michael, how are you <laughs> even on this call? Buns Wait, of steel. Oh, Oh, okay. Thank you, my friend. Godspeed. Oh, thank you. All right. With that in mind, if, if uh, we don't have any other questions for either Amy, Alan, or me, uh, I suppose we uh, might want to uh, let Alan get to his Bob's Burgers recording. No, it's the Simpsons, and then it's whatever Fox decides to run at 8.30, then it's Bob's Burgers, then it's Family Guy. Well, all right, then. I have Amy, to watch my oh. cartoons. This has been fantastic, and, and particularly turning your closet into what is clearly a professional broadcast studio. That's right? absolutely amazing. <laughs> I just figured this way, considering it is mostly a podcast, we could have the better audio in here. So, Well, yeah. Raider Room gives you a, an A+. Plus. I should have put my, my Robert Caro in the background. That's the thing now. Oh. You're supposed to put, there's all, all of like the CNN journalists who are working from home. They all have some Robert Caro books in the background. Um. Is I should that, have put mine in there. That's a thing. Apparently, that's a thing. Well, we gotta, we gotta see if we can get the the Raider Room people on the podcast. <laughs> I'm fascinated by this. I don't want to put my my other. This is a way better space than I usually have for live streams. So. <laughs> okay. 
All right. All right. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. And Amy, thank you again for joining us uh, as well. This is going to be amazing. And uh, we'll publish this on Wednesday on the big anniversary of the first woman in space. Great. Thanks for having me again. And I hope everything goes well tomorrow. I hope you're all, all good health. All good health. Thank you. <laughs>